ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining us once again. future and we respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind and most of all to us here at Crow Canyon. We are grateful to all indigenous people and support the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Thank you to all of our partners. As you know, uh, our, our land acknowledgement and the folks that we acknowledge in it are absolutely central to our mission to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. Our website is being updated all the time now, so please check us out at crowcanyon.org. And thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Kelly. You have you have drawn so many wonderful donations uh, by doing this talk for us uh, at Crow Canyon and. One of my colleagues was telling me yesterday on our very small fundraising team, which is really just me and a few other folks, uh, she said, Liz, you know, there are thousands of people uh, out there that that um, watch us, follow us on Facebook, watch our webinars, and I don't think that they actually know that we're a nonprofit and everything that we do is supported by donations. So this is a shout out to my amazing colleague, Jennifer, uh, to, to thank everyone and to let folks who might not know that we are entirely supported uh, by, by fundraising, by our generous donors like you, and this uh, free webinar series uh, is Are you there, Liz? Uh, yeah, Taylor. Oh, okay, sorry, you just cut out for a moment. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead, uh, everybody, and just, sh I, I have a little bit of a weak connection, so I'm gonna stop my video, but I'm still here and I will finish up with this. Okay, I'm just stopping my video for a sec here because my connection's a little unstable. <laughs> Uh, but I am not, I assure you. Uh, thanks for joining us on Zoom, on Facebook. Taylor will be catching your questions in the chat. And uh, here during um, this talk, please put your questions in the Q&A. You can do them at any time and we will get to them. We're live streaming on Facebook and you can see us after the fact on YouTube. Upcoming webinars, some really, really special ones, folks. I mean, they're all special, but next week we have our dear friend, uh, Hopi archeologist, scholar, and extraordinary human being, Lyle Blanqua, who will be talking about seeking my center place migration through science and tradition. Uh, this is part of the Four Corners lecture series, and it's also um, tied to the release of our soon release of our 40th anniversary volume in which Lyle has a chapter of this name. It will be incredible. Lyle is amazing if you haven't met him or worked with him before. And then the week after that, our own Dr. Ben Bellarado and Tom Wines uh, revisiting the depopulation of the Northern Southwest with dendrochronology, a changing perspective with new dates from Cedar Mesa and the Southern Bears Ears. So I know many of you watching have probably traveled uh, well, with both Lyle and with Ben, uh, who's been uh, doing some, well, research a long time, but this is some updates from some recent work, and you definitely won't want to miss it. Uh, without any further ado, I am so excited to have Dr. Kelly Hayes Gilpin, a friend and colleague of many, many years, uh, uh, with us to talk about duck pots. And if you know anything about Crocan, you know we love duck pots uh, around here from our early research at the Duckfoot site here nearby campus. Um, Kelly is the Curator of Anthropology at the Museum of Northern Arizona and Professor of Anthropology at NAU. And I think everyone knows she needs her research needs no introduction uh, that her interests include pottery and other visual arts on the Southwest Colorado Plateau. So I'm going to hope my video doesn't freeze just so I can say thank you, thank you, thank you, Kelly, for uh, for coming and sharing your work with us. This is really my pleasure. Really exciting. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. When I get my screen up here, we'll have a look at some duck pots because, of course, this is just for Crow Canyon. And I'm gonna start that. And 
is this the right configuration or do I need to swap screens? That I have to go. How's that? Did you unmute? I did. Uh, it was it was actually the the first one was, was the, the right configuration. Right. Sorry, Kelly. Because <laughs> I thought, yeah. OK, That's, great. There we go. That's perfect. That? Does that look good? Yes, that looks perfect. Well, thanks so much for having me. And full disclosure, my husband, Dennis, my co-author on this, is sitting behind me in that field of sunflowers that you see. And he'll he'll hop in for Q&A if, if needed. We're coming to you from Flagstaff, Arizona, and the, the beautiful photo provided by my university in the background is the San Francisco Peaks, um, ancestral homelands, and sacred to a, a great many Native American tribes. Um, including Hopi, Navajo, Zuni, and many more. And um, we are grateful to, to be here and honor them um, and their efforts to continue to preserve this, this beautiful place. What we're gonna do today is take you far east to New York and the Brooklyn Museum. And how did, how did we end up uh, working here about a year ago? I was invited to take part in helping a team of Hopi community curators work on a exhibition of Kachina dolls that should be happening in a, in a year or two uh, that were collected by Stuart Kulin of the Brooklyn Museum in the early 1900s. And while there, we got a tour of their archaeological collections as well as their ethnographic collections. And Dennis reminded me that they had a magnificent collection of pottery from an area that, that he had worked in near Window Rock, Arizona, back when he was an archaeologist with the Navajo Nation Archaeology Department. And a lot of people don't realize that uh, there are Chacoan sites in Arizona. So on the side of what we call the Adobe Curtain, um, we like to remind our New Mexican colleagues that, that we have Chacoan archeology span too on, on this side of the, the state line. So we thought we'd go check out this collection and see what we could learn from it. So here's the Brooklyn Museum of Art. It was founded around 1900 and as a, a museum of science and art, and they hired a curator named Stuart Kulin to do some ethnographic collecting, which he, he did with gusto, and we'll come to that in a moment. But then in the 1930s, it decided to focus its mission more on, on fine arts, and I, I suspect that some of the archaeological collections I wouldn't say fell by the wayside, they're very well cared for, but have not been displayed and, and used by researchers to their full attention because a lot of us think of ourselves as scientists and we don't think of art museums as being a place to do our research. And so that's one of the things I wanna advocate about. So we're used to going into an art museum and seeing a beautiful iconic object like this Egyptian hippopotamus for, for which the Brooklyn Museum is famous or contemporary art like you see on their, their front lawn there. Uh, but it is a, a fabulous multifaceted, large, um, well-run museum. Before I go any further, I do want to mention that because of the history of, of collecting and the way antiquities were, were collected for many of these large Eastern museums, they were excavated without um, scientific documentation about context. So it's likely given that what we know as Southwestern archeologists that these were excavated from human graves. They are probably mortuary offerings. And I wanna offer this warning for anyone who has cultural or personal concerns about viewing such objects. So I won't be showing any, any photos of, of human remains. And I, I do need to uh, take that topic on head on at one point, but I'm going to redact the photo with permission from the Brooklyn Museum. So Stuart Kulin was hired as curator. I think he was stolen away from Pennsylvania and had already achieved a reputation as a collector who could go into the field and find magnificent collections and bring them back um, for display. 
He was focused on exhibits and he was especially focused on ethnography. He was one of the proponents of the, the vanishing Indian myth uh, that, that many of our anthropological and museum colleagues held in, in this time period. So he thought that you had to go out and collect objects to document the history and culture of people who were changing so rapidly that their, their languages and cultures would disappear. And fortunately they were dead wrong. This isn't happening, but it is still a really important part of history for all of us as Americans and for the descendant communities that are still very much with us. So in 1903, he mounted what he called the Red Rock Museum Expedition. And you'll see that on these crispy labels that were attached to some of the, the pottery that, that he collected and um, was put on display at, at the Brooklyn Museum early on, um, but not, uh, not really that much since then. And, and I'll show you that, that some pieces are still on display, but 90% of the, the collection is not. So here's, here's Kulin looking very dapper in his spats and a couple of the, the pieces that he collected. And you'll notice that these are fragments of cooking jars. He didn't only collect beautiful decorated pottery. He did try to collect representative examples. And that was one of the things that made him different from some of the other museum collectors of his time. He, he thought of he was being much more systematic than his peers. Um, and by his day's standards, he, he really was. And he was trying to use objects to tell the history of ancient people up to the present day, his present day, and um, really did not interact with living people very much. He really thought objects spoke a language that um, that he could understand and put into a museum display that would tell that history. So he left out what most anthropologists of the time were doing, including his, his good friend, Frank Hamilton Cushing, who some of you will have heard of for his work at Zuni. Um, Cushing talked to Zunis, learned the language, lived in the community, advocated for land rights, where Keelan was more of a collector. He came in, bought stuff, from middlemen, basically. He wasn't excavating this material himself and took it back to Brooklyn to, to tell this story, but without the voices of the descendants of the people who made it. So there's a little context for him. So where is the Hunter's Point Chacoan community? It's a, a living, thriving Navajo community near Window Rock. And here it is on a map for those who who like maps. We're um, looking at St. Michael's, which is another area that Dennis and I are very interested in the history of archaeology. Here's Window Rock and several other trading posts up here and then down here south of, of St. Michael's, but north of Interstate 40 is Hunter's Point right, right here or simplified Right, right there on, on the t-shirt. There was a trading post at Hunter's Point run by Joe Foley and Joe White. They were proprietors of, or traders to the Navajo. And here's an example of a, a trading token and probably selling goods and supplies to Navajos and buying artworks like textiles and um, artifacts that, that people would dig up. And they, they also went out and did their own digging to collect what were, were then called curios for the market, um, not only for, for sale to a, a nascent tourist industry, but um, largely putting together big collections to sell to museums back east. So here's Joe Foley, the trader, with uh, some of his pots that he excavated, and I have redacted some human remains there. And Stuart Kulin looking very jolly on the right, um, clearly trying to be the, the Western adventurer. A little landscape context for Hunter's Point, a uh, beautiful landscape on this part of the Navajo Nation and thriving 
farming communities and herding communities and and other enterprises not far from the the capital of the Navajo Nation now um, quite a varied landscape and in the context of the the Chacoan world on the right you have uh, the classic map from John Stein and Steve Lexon of the the Chaco world with downtown Chaco as Steve would say right here and the roads radiating out from it and then great kivas and great houses and communities centered on great houses or great kivas that show Chacoan attributes. And most of you are probably familiar in this audience with what those Chacoan attributes are, masonry styles and the kinds of community organization. And you've probably seen pictures of black and white pottery, but what we want to do here is show you how this assemblage is very typical of Chaco Canyon itself. So I have worked mostly in the ancestral Hopi area over here um, on Black Mesa and the Hopi Mesas and what we call the Kayenta archeological province, which overlaps very little. There's, there's a fairly distinct boundary with the Chaco world between the Chaco world and the Kayenta world. And so what I'm very interested in here is how different a Chaco assemblage is from a Kayenta assemblage or from frankly, the, the Mugion assemblages that, that we get down here um, in Eastern Arizona up in the mountains. So it's a very distinctive kind of pottery, but it's also extremely varied and um, kind of exciting. So this is the history of collecting and research in that Hunter's Point area. Stuart Kulin, we've just talked about, um, connecting with Joe Foley and Joe White, who had already been digging sites in this community for several years when, when Kulin came in and bought um, well over 100 pots for, for the Brooklyn collection. Then those were, a few were put on display in Brooklyn. And A.V. Kidder mentioned this collection in his 1924 synthesis of Southwest archaeology that this was an interesting collection and fed into presumably his understanding of the distribution of pottery styles and dates and developing the Pecos classification the terms you're probably familiar with Pueblo one, Pueblo two, Pueblo three. So this might have fed into that. But um, as far as we know, nobody has studied it since A.V. Kidder. So it's, it's ripe for revisitation. Then, in terms of field work that was more systematic and scientific, the Museum of Northern Arizona did some excavations along Navajo Route 12 in the 1960s. So this was part of highway archaeology, what was then called salvage archaeology, getting going. And then Northern Arizona University did a few little projects out here in the 1970s with roads and Indian Health Service water lines and things like that, so small projects. And then the Navajo Nation Archaeology Department uh, took over doing those, those projects that were necessary for any kind of development or CRM work in the, the 80s and 90s. And um, Dennis has provided a, a citation here for a report that he can tell you more about if anyone's interested in this area. That's um, the larger area would be called the Black Creek Valley. So sporadic work in this area, a good awareness of what's out there. So what is out there? The Hunter's Point community is just a great example of a Chacoan community organization. You have the Black Creek Wash here, and then you have a great house and a great kiva with it. And then you have your scattered farmsteads isolated rooms and small houses out here south of the creek and, and here and there. And there's a great kiva down here as well, serving this second part of the community. So it has kind of a dual organization, which should be familiar from all of you who know something about Chaco. You have your great houses, you have your small houses, you have small houses clustering around a great 
a great kiva. So there are two kinds of, of components to, to these larger communities. And, and this is not what we're seeing in um, the Kayenta area to the west at all. A great Dennis map showing you the great house with a couple of enclosed kivas. The midden, just where you would expect it to be. A great kiva surrounded by a swale. And I think if we were doing LIDAR and fancy things today, we might want to look for road segments and things like that. But that has not been done to my knowledge. So very Chaco and so my question was, assuming that most pottery is probably locally produced with the Chaco, would the pottery look like Chaco as much as the architecture does? And the answer is yes. So how is the Brooklyn Museum caring for this collection and making it accessible? We were just really happy with their storage conditions, very professional compactor storage with the, the windows in there. Um, this is from a different project, but if you know Dennis, you know how much he loves Navajo pottery. So um, they've got a great collection of, of early Navajo pieces as well that we were able to look at. So most of the Hunter's Point community pottery is in these cases in, in the storage area, but um, they have something that a lot of museums aspire to called open storage. So there's an open storage area where they put as many objects on display as they can, but with minimal interpretation. So this is just about the public being able to go in and see this is the breadth and range of our collections and the kinds of things that, that we have in our collections that are available for study and for viewing. So you get a little bit of contextual information provided, but um, much greater visibility and, and security. These loose cases were, were very difficult to get into security-wise. There's like one guy in the whole museum who can manage the locks on this. So they're very secure and the public can just come in and wander. So probably four or five of these are from the Red Rock collection that we'll be talking about. So uh, a whole case of Southwest painted pottery and then a whole case of historic, mostly ancestral Zuni and Acoma pottery next to it. And I enjoyed seeing that continuity, you know, that indication that this is ancestral to this and it's still a living tradition. And then we had some Northwest Coast carved wood over here. And unfortunately, this is the only case that represents North America, uh, North American indigenous art. But um, the, the museum has published some of this collection and this volume from 1991 is still a, a great one to, to look at if you can find a, a copy. It's just really beautifully produced. Objects of myth and memory American Indian Art at the Brooklyn Museum. And this is mostly about Stuart Kulin's collection from all over North America, mostly ethnographic, but he does include, uh, or the editors do include some information about the, the Red Rock Expedition in here. So highly recommended. Here we are working with curator Nancy Rossoff, shout out to Nancy. Um, she was our host and facilitator. And we were happy to be able to, to give back to the museum by updating the identifications of some of these items and, and helping identify some items that whose tags had gone missing, the, the bane of archaeological collections this old as tags fall off and you're trying to reunite them with the the records and so we we tried to give back by by helping with that a little bit and they in turn gave us access and let us um, do some work in both of the storage areas it was it was just kind of spooky to be surrounded by these European paintings and um, trying to photograph Chaco and duck pots so all told we looked at 144 vessels from the Red Rock area. And there are eight different ceramic wares for those who like to count and 31 types. 
So the types are your slices of time, your stylistic attributes, and then the wares give us utility wear versus decorated wear. And then where were these pots made in the Chacoan tradition or other traditions in the, the surrounding area? And if we were in some areas like the Kayanta area, I'd expect four wares, and that's that's it. They were they were very uh, insular up on Black Mesa. And if I was down in the Petrified Forest area, I'd expect probably 15 wares because that seems to have been a travel corridor with a lot of trade going on and a lot of intersection of Maguillon and um, Colorado Plateau traditions. So this is kind of right, right in between some of the other areas I've mentioned. It's overwhelmingly Cibola whiteware that's either local or from other Chacoan sites. Uh, not from the West, but but from the East or or local, but done as part of that Chaco and community of practice, if you will. So we're talking about mineral paint, um, black on white pottery, shirred temper, and some pretty distinctive vessel form attributes that I'll go into next. Unfortunately, there wasn't very much utility wear, not very many cooking pots in this collection which is just due to the collecting bias toward decorated wear, or if these were mortuary assemblages, those, those are often biased towards decorated wear. But what utility wear there was appeared to be local. And then the trade wear was just not very much a, at all. And I'll show you some examples toward the end. White Mountain Red Wear, Maguillon Brown Wear from the South, Puerco Valley Brown Wear from, also from the South. Porco Valley Redware, also known as Sholo Black on Red. And there was one vessel that appeared to us to be McElmo Black on White from up in your area, in the Crow Canyon area, or, or possibly some of those Mesa Verde migrants coming down into the Chaco area, um, as well as into the Chiscas. So that was interesting. And what really interested us was this wide variation of vessel forms. And that's what we want to talk about mainly. So the first thing that we learned was, and this is partly based on architecture, but, but mostly on the frequencies of kinds of pottery in the collection, is that we're looking at a small population in the 800s, and then a peak population, just when you would expect it for a Chaco, an outlier between about 1030 and 1125. And depopulation after 1150 won't say abandonment, but certainly a reorganization of the settlement pattern, not a large community at that point. And then we had one plain orange flat based bowl that looked kind of like Payuki polychrome, um, or gubernador polychrome only without paint in this case that looks like a kind of pan Pueblo and Navajo style that was common in the 1700s after the Pueblo revolt and during the reconquest. So that helps bridge us to contemporary historic and contemporary Navajo um, herding communities that are that are there today. Our utility wear pottery sequence, some of you will be familiar, goes from plain gray, lino gray, which we didn't have any examples because we don't think this community included a basket maker three component or it didn't come up really in, in the work that's been done so far. So that's an open question to look for, but you've got your neck banded pottery these wide neck bands that some experimentation has suggested help you control boil over. So they're in advance over a, a plain necked jar if you're cooking beans and don't want them to boil over. And a more efficient to make version of that with a coiled corrugated neck, but it would still have the same function. And then we get uh, a switch in probably around 1030 to all over corrugated vessels. And we see this throughout the ancestral Pueblo area and the vessel forms are just a little different in the different traditions. And then some of these get kind of fancy with uh, zoned and patterned corrugated designs. And 
little handles and the um, necks start to be inverted a little more through time. So uh, our utility wire gives us a pretty good chronological sequence. And let's look at the black on white styles as they change. So starting out with uh, early red mesa, black on white in the Cibola whiteware, we've got thin lines, a lot of these stacked chevron kinds of things. The squiggly line hatcher comes in and uh, this is a very weird vessel form uh, with lobes on, on both sides and a handle in the middle. So they're doing weird vessel forms that are hard to make right from the beginning is the point we would make about this. Red Mesa Black on White, if you're familiar with the sequence characterized by triangles with dots and getting into some curvilinear and spiraling forms, these banded designs are very common in these, these earlier decorative styles. So these are bowls that would have been used for serving food. And apologies for the harsh lighting in, in one of our areas, the open storage area, we, we didn't have, we had bright lights, but not, not as much control over ways to diffuse that light. So these are, these are record shots, not professional photos. More red mesa black on white, but here we're getting into a later Pueblo II style called gallop black on white with the diagonal hatched, very bold ribbons and some fun dotted triangles crammed onto the handle there and then a typical red mesa design here. And then on the right, we're, we're getting a transition from the red mesa scrolls into the Escovada style with our elongated triangles and some negative space. As we go through time, Chaco and Potters love to use negative space. The, the white becomes just as important and sometimes pops even more than, than the black. And you get a lot of interlocking. And this little animal handle is more characteristic to me anyway, in my experience of the white mountain tradition of Cibola White, where in the South, we would see this, these little lizards and, and animals as handles a little later on to the South in types like Tularosa Black on White in the White Mountains. So that's one of the more fun examples. And then this one is just darling. It's really small. It's a elbow shaped pipe with a, a rounded bowl and perforated all the way through the handle. And we get grayware and brownware pipes a lot in the Ancestral Pueblo area, but not very many decorated ones. This is so well made and polished in that Red Mesa style with the dotted triangles and the, the squiggled lines across here. So this is a really special piece that would have been difficult to make. and. Um, the work of a, a master potter, I would say. So now we're getting into probably the late 10 hundreds, Gallup black on white. This style is so characteristic of Chaco and this hatched style spreads into the Mesa Verde area. So you have these hatched designs up there where Crow Canyon is and the Cayenta people also like to make these hatch designs, and, and we call it Dagoji black on white in the Kayenta area. And all of these type names are based on places. I should point out, this is not necessarily where it was made. I'm not saying that this was made in Gallup, New Mexico. I'm saying that some previous archeologist, probably HP Mira named it Gallup black on white because a lot was found in that area and he needed a, a geographic name but it was probably made in Chaco Canyon on the Chisca Slope. And I would argue over here at Hunter's Point as well. So here's a vessel form that archeologists call a seed jar, but they were probably used for storing lots and lots of things, not only seeds, but you know, easy to seal up and keep the mice out. And another one of these pictures with the funky lobes, very strange shoulder 
And this might be a duck pot. It didn't have a distinctive tail, but it does look like the, the wing forms on some of our duck pots coming up. Gallop black on white with a red mesa design. Here, another seed pot, except this one probably had a neck on it that broke off and was reworked into a seed jar. This one has a really nice surface finish. And this is the kind of surface finish we see on White Mountain series. See below white where a little bit later, a nice thick slip with a little bit of a crackle to it, uh, just like you see in historic Zuni and Acoma pottery today, a really nice thick slip. And then you also have Chaco and pots, probably the majority without slip and not even very much polish, kind of a rough surface and a lot of fire clouding and just not, not that much attention to, to surface treatment. So this is what we call a fire cloud where the fuel gets a little too close to the edge of the vessel uh, when it's um, being fired. And these were probably pit fired in the same kinds of features you might use to, to roast corn. Another characteristic that I do not see in the Kayenta or the, the White Mountain series is this kicked up base or dimple in the base. Loads of these pictures in this collection have that and so do a lot of the, the vessels from Chaco Canyon sites. And whether this is to help you carry it on your head, which is the contemporary Zuni explanation, or whether it makes it stronger like a wine bottle, like the base of a wine bottle um, helps that bottle resist the pressure of the, the liquid sealed in the vessel. So it might be for strength, it might be for carrying it. It, it might be something congruent with architecture where you want a flat base uh, as opposed to the rounded base that we see in some of the other black on white pottery traditions. The, the red on here is, is just a catalog number. It's not um, decoration or a signature or anything like that. Then this is something I, I really only see in Chaco Canyon collections so far, in, in my so far limited experience, this very smeary white slip. So your, your clay is giving you a, a dark gray surface. And instead of just leaving it like that, which they did a lot of the time, they're putting a very washy, thin slip that gives you this streaky appearance, but it's a very bright white um, streaky appearance. And then polish that a little bit sometimes and um, then paint over that. So this is a, an iron-based paint or possibly iron manganese mix probably with a plant binder, like um, boiled down Rocky Mountain beeweed or something like that. Uh, probably a similar recipe to what Hopi and Zuni and Acoma potters are using today. Then Chaco fans out there will recognize this as just the quintessentially sh shaped Chaco in pitcher with the tall stovepipe neck and this little bulge here. Um, probably evolved from those cylinder jars. We did not find any Chaco and cylinder jars in this assemblage, but um, a number of these, these stovepipe neck pitchers. And then here's the, the use of negative space that, that I was referring to before, kind of fully developed here. And that is very, um, very characteristic of Chaco black on white which may have been made by craft specialists and perhaps not only in Chaco Canyon, but, but in these outliers as well. So similar to the Gallup style time period, we've got Escovada black on white with these exuberant interlocking triangles. So here you've got this style on a bowl and on a, a duck pot, little wings, little tail, uh, maybe that's too much of an imagination stretch, but we'll get some that are more realistic coming up. And one thing to point out here is this bowl is probably made by somebody who's still learning to make pottery. And Patty Crown at UNM has um, studied the learning frameworks 
from looking at um, ancient pottery and working with an art therapist and a child psychologist. And she can kind of tell you maybe about what age students were learning to make pottery in these communities. But you'll you'll just notice that the line control is a little shaky and the spatial control is a little shaky. It's pretty darn good, but um, not quite up to the skill level of this potter, who's got a very unusual shape and very irregular shape to deal with. And yet they're getting some very symmetrical, confident um, spatial organization and, and line work on this thing. So I'm still learning absolute master of the art form. And that's always fun to see. Another thing we noticed in this assemblage, because it has not been selected for what's beautiful to put on display, this is probably what, what came out of the ground, what, what Joe Foley was, was digging up and um, Kulin didn't, didn't choose for aesthetic qualities. Um, he was looking for cultural and historical qualities as well. And so you get vessels like this that have, um, they've got the fire clouds, that this had cracked down here, and someone had decided to repair it. And this is somebody in that community, not one of the excavators or museum people. So we see these repair holes a lot in ancient Pueblo and pottery. They probably used a small stone drill to drill on either side of a major crack and then wrap some cordage in there and maybe even seal it with pine pitch to try to hold that together for a little longer. The neck, probably of one of those tall necked Chaco and pitchers, the neck had obviously broken. And so they chipped off the rest of it, ground down this edge, and now you have a, a seed jar or something you can use to hold smaller objects to lots and lots of repair and reuse in this collection. So here's one that you can look for those attributes that, that I just talked about. We have pretty confident line work in that Escavada style interlocking, in this case, little key shapes rather than the triangles. The streaky slip and that kicked up base, very, very chaco. And here's a great example of somebody who hasn't quite mastered their spatial skills or their motor skills yet, but they're they're trying hard and doing a good job. So this one isn't terribly well formed or finished. And the person who's painting it, probably a child, is understanding the design they want to make, but just not quite able to execute it. So great example of somebody learning. And this one I would say was formed by a master potter and did a pretty good job for Chaco of polishing, but hadn't quite decided what design styles they wanted to use. They got the outlines and then decided to play with every kind of, of filler. And this is one of those things where if you broke this up into pot shirts, I would give you three different type names, but they all date to the same, same time period in probably the late 10 hundreds, so, so it's fine. But um, let's, let's play around with different forms of hatching and up here in the handle where it's kind of tight to get your paintbrush in. Let's just make those solid. So very creative. And, and back to master potter land. Here we've got interlocking solid and hatched, which um, in the typology we're, we're using to, to help us with chronology, we're calling this reserve style. Interlocking, solid and hatched, and great use of spatial control, sizing those elements to fit on this tapering vessel form. More reuse. This bowl had apparently broken in half. And so its center of gravity tilted a little bit and lots of red paint residue on the inside and then just about ground off. So here, instead of using a, a matati and, or a, some kind of a ground stone artifact as a, to grind paint or use as a palette, 
they're just recycling a large bowl shirt. And it um, has this fabulous checkerboard design, not terribly well executed, but pretty well done. Um, good enough to make it attractive. And this gets classified as Puerco black on white, but it's pretty much the same time period as early reserve and Gallup and Escovada styles. Okay. This one really surprised us. It's a, a ring jar or a donut jar. So this hole goes all the way through. And this is a vessel form that we find rarely in Mesoamerica, South America, um, ancestral Pueblo area. It's very difficult to make this and, and have it not break in, in firing or slump um, while you're trying to form it. And it had a, a handle that probably came up all the way to the rim, which is challenge enough, but, but then you have this, um, this donut shape down here. And here comes the handle possibly attached somehow up here like, like this. And these are no known function. I'm, I'm sure it had meaning but I'm not privy to that meeting, whether it might've been ceremonial. I don't wanna fall into the archeological trap of saying, well, I'm an archeologist and my view is that if I don't know what it is, it must be ritual. So, um, but there, I just did it. But we do find these a little later in the White Mountain series of Little Colorado. I mean, not Little Colorado Whiteware, of Cibola Whiteware, but in the upper Little Colorado area. And then this one, I, I have not come across anything quite like this outside of, of the Chaco area. So a double spouted pitcher with a very wide handle on the back here. So this is, you're seeing the handle on the left image and then on the right image here and just very well formed twin spouts on there with slightly different um, Chaco black on white hatched designs on them with, again, that masterful use of, of negative space. So you get the, the hatched ribbons interlocking and then this wandering ribbon going around here and then these intersecting triangles that, that give us uh, a band of trapezoids that, that just pops right out. And, and then you have, again, the learners and some of these are just impossible to classify. Like, what kind, what type would I call this? You know, um, the the parallel lines are really unusual. That's usually not the layout you have in the Chaco area. And it's really hard to tell what design elements they're going for here. Is it those little hooks or keys? Is it the elongated triangles? Or are they just trying out a little bit of of everything? and it just becomes impossible to classify or put a time period on something like that. But um, I can imagine someone was having fun playing with that. As with these, so lots of um, miniature vessels and very often, but not always, the miniature vessels look like they're practice pieces. We're not getting the coils completely wiped down there. The rim isn't very even. Um, this is a hard shape to make. It looks like it's really well done. And this makes me suspect um, something that Patty Crown found a lot in her research is that sometimes the pots are very well formed, but they're not very well painted. So maybe mom or auntie is making the pot and then handing it to a child apprentice and saying, you paint this. And we often find life forms on kid pots like that. So we've got the bird tracks here. And you just wonder, uh, what is this child thinking with the concentric circles and bug like things and just kind of kind of experimenting with how do I get a, a design onto uh, an irregular vessel shape like this, but still using the basic building blocks of, of in this case, red mesa black on white repertoire some masterful duck pots here, including the one on the left has actual 
molded wings so and a, a nice tail. So it really looks like, okay, they're definitely trying to do a, a bird shape there where these two are just more abstract um, triangular vessel forms. And for, for me, this seemed like an unusual number of duck pots. And what, um, what I'm sure we're seeing is that for those of us who are used to studying assemblages of pot sherds, we see these broken up into pieces and you might get a few that you say, yeah, that might've been part of a, an effigy vessel, but the rest of it is just breaking up into to pieces and you don't know that it was an unusual vessel form. You're just classifying it as a, a jar in this case or a bowl if the decoration's on the, the inside surface. Okay, last few slides here. We've got White Mountain Redware, um, just a couple of pieces. And these would have been traded in probably from further south. These are classified as Wingate Polychrome and St. John's Polychrome for, for reasons I won't go into unless somebody gets really, really wants to learn this typology and then you can come use one of our type collections at the Museum of Northern Arizona, or I'll, I'll point you to Roy Carlson's book on White Mountain Redware. But um, these are starting to come into the Chaco world before it reorganizes. And then this, this tradition does develop into some pretty fancy pottery um, in the Manuelito Canyon, Ganado, areas and especially in the White Mountains around Taylor and Snowflake and Springerville and so forth. And then this tradition ultimately does evolve into or is developed by master potters into the Zuni and Acoma glazeware traditions and then and then onward to the Rio Grande. So these are these are really important in the history of Pueblo pottery, these these polychrome types. And I know I must have some rock art enthusiasts in there who love the little people. So here's the, the little guy in the middle of that St. John's polychrome bowl. And um, you, wanna, you wanna give him a flute, but he, he is not a flute player, no flute, no arms, but uh, maybe he's dancing. And he's probably not a he. Um, just broke one of my own rules of iconography and in giving that a gendered pronoun. Um, don't don't even know if it's human, could be insect, could be a cicada or something like that. Um, the main point being that that we just don't know, but it does kind of um, fit within a tradition of life forms in both rock art and pottery painting in the larger region. And then a, a less exciting form of trade wear in the Hunter's Point community is um, Mugion tradition, Mugion brown, where these very open, um, low slung bowl forms with a, a soft brownware paste, a smudged interior, a red fire clouded or even slipped exterior sometimes. So these, these black shiny interiors that really contrast with your, your black on white bowls that are the majority of the assemblage. And we do think these are probably imported from the South. So what have we learned? And I'll wrap up. We think we've got a date range for the Hunter's Point community. And it wasn't surprising or exciting. It's just right in there with the Chaco world. The pottery confirms a Chaco and cultural affiliation as suggested by the community layout and architecture. And we had a great time working beyond the basic vessel forms that you get with classifying uh, a shirt assemblage or a fragmentary assemblage, working with whole vessels, especially this many, is really exciting and gives you, I think, a, a better appreciation for what these potters were able to accomplish in their communities. There's a wider range of vessel forms than I would have expected as someone who mostly worked to the West. A wide range of skill levels, which was a lot of fun. Um, people are, are teaching and learning in this community. A high frequency of reuse and modifications. So that, that could suggest that quite a lot of this is, is trade wear or had significance beyond a simple function. Beyond, I need something to hold water, I'll just go make another one to hold water when it breaks. They were curating these, um, reusing them, modifying them, trying to repair them. 
And then this bird imagery that persists through the whole sequence. It's not like one generation thought birds were cool and made birds. They're, the bird forms are appearing in throughout the stylistic sequence and that suggests some connection with community identity and perhaps ritual practice or symbolic meanings and um, the association potentially of birds with water. Um, and a lot of contemporary potters refer to these as, as duck pots and are noted, noting that um, connection between vessels that hold water and, and ducks as, as water birds. And um, ducks are, are very important in Pueblo worldview, especially Zuni. And with that, I want to thank um, the Brooklyn Museum and my co-author Dennis and um, our co-conspirator on this, Nancy Rossoff in Brooklyn, and ask if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, hugely interesting, fascinating to get to see those vessels. It's really a huge gift to, uh, to the public, to public education, to the descendants of the people who occupied these communities to even be able to see these. Uh, so it, it's really a service that you uh, did the work, did the analysis of bringing back, um, sharing it uh, out here uh, to, well, out here and virtually to everyone, um, things that no one would get to see, which which kind of uh, drives sort of the, the elephant in the room question that is on a number of the questions here around repatriation, right? Um, spectacular, amazing things, um, uh, not really seen, looked at, interpreted, uh, accessed uh, until now. What what do you think is 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 going to happen, or is going on with respect to the to the ethic and the intentions of the museums with respect to uh, collections like this? Well, I can't speak for the Brooklyn Museum, but I can, you know, just re refer to some of the conversations that that I heard while I was there. And they're definitely, I can attest firsthand because I was there with the Hopi team, including one of the community curators on the um, the Kachina Dahl exhibit project is also the repatriation coordinator. And he he was taking some time with, um, with Nancy and the collections to move their repatriation inventories along. So one of the, the I would say, tragedies of, of this kind of collecting that happened in the first part of the 20th century is that the, the they were these ex, these diggers for for lack of a better term and that is what they called themselves these diggers were digging graves and sometimes they just took the pots and and left the the people there and then if that's documented then you have an, an unassociated funerary object but in a lot of cases, the human remains were also collected and studied. And in this case, the Brooklyn Museum became an art museum and the human remains were transferred to the Field Museum in Chicago. So now you have um, unassociated funerary objects that might have been able to have been associated had people been, been keeping track, had the diggers been keeping track of, of what was with who, and, and they weren't. So the Field Museum is um, is working on their NAGPRA compliance, and I don't have details. Uh, I haven't um, followed up um, on this collection there, but um, these are not documented as being funerary. And so that then it becomes a question of what do the tribes, how do the tribes want to classify these? And they're really focused in this case on the sacred and ceremonial ethnographic items, um, belongings that Stuart Kulin collected that should not have been alienated from their community. So that's what the Hobie tribe is, is concentrating on. Can't speak for other tribes, but um, they are in compliance and they are in dialogue and, and they are working on that. And you know, my guess is that the work will slowly progress along a continuum of priorities until you get to these items that are probable funerary items, and then what would the tribes like to do with those? And my sense is that um, most museums are amenable to having those conversations. I know, I know the one where I work, the Museum of Northern Arizona, is having those conversations. Like, yes, we follow the letter of the law, but then what else can we do? 
um, to decolonize and um, be more respectful and work more closely with communities. So those, those conversations are ongoing. They're generally not public because a lot of it's exploratory. And in a lot of cases, tribes don't want to reveal um, information or set a precedent or something like that. So um, it needs to be um, to be careful and respectful and, and collaborative. So one of the things that, that I think we can do as scientists is just keep working on the documentation in dialogue with the communities. So um, if these artifacts should go back in the ground and complete their intended life cycles, like we're pretty sure we know uh, more or less what their original makers and, and owners um, intended for them, can we use our scientific skills, especially with digital documentation to, to document them and have the images available for future potters, especially future artists to draw on. And there are a lot of potters that I'm working with who love to see photos of these collections. They like even better to see them in person, but they're a continent away. And there are collections like this in Europe too. Um, as everybody knows that aren't subject to, to NAGPRA, but are still very much of interest to people in the descendant communities. Yeah. So the collaborative catalogs movement is one way to go. Um, document digitally, make available digitally, uh, maybe make them available password protected to community members initially, and then decide yes. what can be opened up to the public. So um, I, think, I think just making communities aware of, of what the collections are and then working collaboratively would be my, my answer to that. That's possibly the best answer I've ever heard. Uh, uh, thank you, Kelly. That's, that, that's spectacular. And, and it, it kind of offers some, some hope and some actionable uh, frameworks maybe for, for descendants, for, for others to, to be able to move this along and not, not just yeah, look so at So I would refer is. people to Jim Enote's uh, manifesto on community collaboration and museums and the collaborative catalogs movement. I think if you, if you Google that um, Jim was the director of the Ashiwi Owan Museum at, at mm -hmm. Zuni and is really the spokesperson who who kind of got going on. Let's let's collaborate with communities. Right, oh, wonderful. It, do you have one or one or two minutes? We have some sort of uh, uh, pottery nerd questions. <laughs> to, uh... People can put up with it. Otherwise, they can email me pottery nerd questions later. Okay, is, well, is everybody up uh, for? nerd questions they're just they're short and i thought uh, even though I, I you know we're we're a couple minutes over i thought it might be fun to just throw some of these out especially because you know some of these folks uh like our former employee sam bone camp uh wanted to know if you feel the collection is has a higher percentage of novice pots uh than others that would be a good question for patty crown um it's a higher proportion of novice pots than i would see in a kanta assemblage mm -hmm but it's definitely not a Kayenta assemblage. So I would direct that to Patty Crown who has worked with Chaco assemblages before. And then she's also worked with Membrace and Hoacom. And one of the most exciting things, and I believe this is an Akiva article, it could be American antiquity, I should have looked this up, is showing that apparently Hoacom potters became, were beginning at I think a later age like little kids were working on pottery and membrace and hoakam. They like they waited for a later age till they had more control, so to speak, before they started making pottery, or at least pottery that was allowed to be fired and and entered the the use life stream. And I might have that backwards. I should have I should have looked that up, but it would be really neat to compare this with membrace and hoakam and kayenta. And then I do see a lot of learner pots, and so did Patty in mm -hmm. Jedi Yellowware. So ancestral Hopi pottery from the 1300s, it seems like a very high proportion of apprentice pieces, comparable to this. Yeah. Really neat. Thank you. Um, uh, one of our one of our viewers uh, wants to know: Is it possible to look at pots uh, uh, with certain forms and decorations belonging to families or schools of, of production uh, instead of just geographical or stylistic categories? This is something that a lot of pottery analysts aspire to, and I've never gone that deep. 
but there was a great study in the 70s or 80s by, uh, she might have been in art history rather than archaeology, Hannah Hughes at University of Colorado looked at the Kawaika collection um, from the 1300s and, and into the 1400s. That's at the um, University of Colorado Museum and Earl Morris Legacy Collection. So those of you in Colorado will be familiar with, with Earl Morris. Um, and that collection was a great one to study families and learning fra frameworks because a lot of the Jedido yellowware balls have exterior designs that are repeated. Mm -hmm. And she was looking at, at grave lots. So again, using known mortuary materials mm -hmm. um, that are important to document because um, not when she was looking at them, but now, um, you know, they, they will be reburied um, when, when they come up in their turn of priority. But um, she was finding that those exterior designs on pots clustered in grave lots. So suggesting that they belong to an individual, and that suggests a family, knowing what we do about ancestral um, mm -hmm. and, and contemporary or historic um, Hopi kinship frameworks that the, um, the family household group, extended family, was very important. And so those might have been family signatures. And they're not made all by the same individual. You know, you get the, the learning mm -hmm stages of learning represented, but they're trying to do the same design or it's just executed in a slightly different way, but it's mostly the same design. So I think it would be harder with um, with this kind of pottery and not having the, the spatial context to kind of test your, your inferences about how they might be grouped. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, we'll let you go. We can always talk about this for another hour. Um, we're, we're uh, I know- uh, if you want to email uh, Dr. Hayes Gilpin, I know that she will be happy to to engage any more with, questions. When I get done with faculty meetings, give me. Give yes, me. exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Spectacular, spectacular presentation. And uh, we will be chatting with you soon. And you and Dennis are always welcome. We will we have uh, we have a hogan for you should you ever want to come visit. <laughs> well, thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Thanks so much, Kelly. Take care.